writer for all seasons. He was the first sports media personality to involve pro athletes, politicians, judges, entertainers, and media personalities in his community endeavors. In November 1974, he became the first Afro-American to host and produce his own sports television special in prime time on NBC affiliate WRC-TV4 in Washington, D.C. His special guest, the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And, you know, they say that our friendship is, is like our shadows. They're sticking with you as long as you're in the sun, but once you cross over into the shade, the shadow disappears. How do you distinguish your friends? Well, I wrote something once as this. Friendship is a priceless gift that cannot be bought in our soul, but its value is far greater than a mountain made of gold. For gold is cold and lifeless, it can neither see nor hear. In time of trouble, it's powerless to cheer. It has no ears to listen, no heart to understand. It cannot bring you comfort or reach out a helping hand. So when you ask God for gifts, be thankful if he sins. Not diamonds, pearls, or riches, but the love of real true friends. Welcome to Calculations. I'm Gary Johnson, and our special guest today is the one and only Harold Bell. For those of you who are outside of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Bell, and then you're going to hear from him. Mr. Bell is the godfather of sports talk radio in Washington, D.C. I grew up listening to him putting my AM radio in the window so I could get that signal. But throughout the mid-60s, 70s, and 80s, Mr. Bell embarked on a new medium with sports talk radio. He turned it into message music. He, used, he had classic interviews. He interviewed sports celebrities, politicians, and talked about the newsmakers of the day and brought them on the show. The show and the format became wildly popular, and Harold's, in addition to all that, he and his wife have been active for at least five decades uh, with underserved youth through their charity, Kids in Trouble. I want to introduce to you Mr. Harold Bell, because he's going to be talking about his relationship and an anniversary coming up with the greatest Muhammad Ali, Welcome, Mr. Thank you, ben. Jerry. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to put on this special show. It is a special show indeed. I want to get right to it because um, I want to find out how did you first meet or when did you first meet Muhammad Ali? Uh, just tell us about that. Well, 1967, I met Muhammad Ali on the campus of Howard University. At that time, I was working for the United Planning Organization, a nonprofit organization as a neighborhood worker. My, my buddy and my partner, Petey Green, a legendary radio and television uh, talk show host here in, in Washington, got me the job. I had returned home from um, chasing my dream in the NFL. I played minor league fall, football in Charleston, West Virginia for a year before I got cut. Uh, I had left school trying to chase my dream because there was uh, some things I wanted to do for my mother and my brothers. And I came home and uh, ran into Peter Green and Marvin Gaye uh, standing in front of the Howard Theater one night. And uh, <clears throat> Marvin was an old friend from back in the day. And of course, Petey, I met out at uh, Burning Tree Golf Course in 1957. Uh, when I was um, a friend of mine, a neighbor took me out there to caddy on the weekends, uh, try to earn money uh, to help my mom. Well, I got the job with the United Planning Organization. They hired three neighborhood workers. One was Petey Green, one was H. Rap Brown, and the other was Harold Bell. Mr. James Bank, was, who was the executive director of the United Planning Organization, was a class act, man. He was a beautiful, beautiful brother that really cared about the community. Well, now we come to 1967. I've been with the UPO for two years. And I'm standing out in front of Ben's Chili Bowl uh, one day, and Petey comes up and says, hey, man, you know, Muhammad Ali is up on the campus of Howard University. I said, what? He said, yeah, man. I said, come on, man, let's go. 
He said, man, I can't go, man. I got to meet with Mr. Bites. I said, well, I'm gone. I'm gone. It's about a five or 10 minute walk. And I walked uh, up to Howard University and there was all these young folks, man. It must have been two or 300 of them, man. And they were standing around Muhammad Ali and he was talking to them. They were laughing and having a great time. So man, I, I eased my way through the crowd and I was almost up to nose to nose to him, <laughs> you understand? And I listened to what he had to say, man. It was fascinating, the kids enjoyed it. And uh, after about 20 or 30 minutes, man, he said, hey, I need somebody to uh, show me around the campus or show me uh, Washington, D.C. So I grabbed him by his hand. I said, come on, champ. He wasn't talking to me. He wanted one of them pretty little girls to grab him. <laughs> but I grabbed I kidnapped him. I kidnapped him. And so we started walking down the Georgia Avenue corridor toward the Howard Theater again. And as we're walking down the past Wonder Bread place, I look back. And man, I see all these kids like Pied Piper following us, you know? So um, the champ and I got to talking and he was asking me about what I was doing. And I told him, man, I'm out here working with young people, man, out here in the streets. I work for an organization called the United Planning Organization. And he said, well, man, stay out here. You need, we, these kids need you. And as we're walking down the street, man, cars are backing up, man. Women are getting out the cars, coming over and hugging and kissing him, man. And he's, had, he's having a ball, man. <laughs> he was really enjoying himself. So now we get down to 7T, which is where the Howard Theater is. And I see one a, a bunch of guys, you know, hanging out on the block. And boy, when they saw Muhammad Ali, they went, oh. And one of the guys, uh, Harvey, Harvey, we call him the oldest teenager, uh, came up and started shadow boxing with the champ, man. And it was just a great, beautiful day, man. And that was 1967. And, uh, you know, here it is five years later, after I'd gone through the Roman Leader Program, I left the uh, United Planning Organization to go with the Roman Leader Program, DC Department of uh, Recreation, uh, on its youth gang task force. So I was still out in the street doing the same thing that I was doing. But what happened, I got lucky, the United Planning Organization had um, given uh, the DC Recreation Department several grants to hire Roman leaders. So Mr. Banks said, well, y'all gonna get this money. Y'all gotta take Harold Bell. So that's how I got the job. It was one of the elite jobs in DC Recreation Department. I worked the playgrounds, the courts, the schools, wherever there were young people in need, I was there. So I, that was really a great job, man. So now we, we move on and of course, um, 1969. After the rise, 1968, I'm still out in the streets. And who again comes up and, and is Petey Green. He said, man, your man is down there on the 7th Street corridor, you know, walking the corridor. I said, Petey, what you talking about, my man? You know, uh, he said, President Richard Nixon, fool. I said, what? <laughs> man, I ran down there, must be about three blocks away. I'm going down there to see uh, Mr. Nixon because I, he and I become close friends doing my time caddying for him at Burning Tree Golf Course, man. So now people are all around and man, I couldn't get nowhere near the president. The Secret Service would not let me anywhere near him. So I told uh, one of the Secret Service man, I said, man, tell him it's Harold Bell and I caddied for him at Burning Tree Golf Course. So the Secret Service man looked at me and he said, hey, write him a letter. <laughs> so that's what I did. I wrote him a letter and um, to the White House and explain uh, where I had been since we had last seen each other in 1957 and uh, that I was uh, still working on getting my, my college degree. It was great to see him out in the neighborhood. But man, uh, two weeks later, I get another letter. I get a letter from the White House. It was from President Nixon. So my wife and I, we were all excited. We opened up the letter and the president was saying how proud he was of me to see that I have returned to the young people whose lives once resembled my very own. And he was so proud of me. And uh, he said uh, he would stay in touch and be in touch. And two weeks later, my wife and I get another letter. This is an invitation to the White House for lunch with the president. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Stop there. Stop there. We're going to come back to that. Um, I want to send you, I'm going to show you some things some photos, some you've seen, 
some you haven't seen and get you to talk about um, just what these photos are and what they mean to you or what you remember about some of these photos. Wow. You see, you see that one? Yeah, man, that was uh, one of the biggest nights of, uh, in sports, really. That was uh, Muhammad Ali uh, knocking out George Foreman, uh, which many people thought uh, that he would lose that fight. And what happened, I was supposed to be there in Zaire with him. I had gone to Chicago to meet with him. Um, I had, uh, we arranged that up at the Poconos Mountains, his, uh, his camp, you know? And I went up there uh, to uh, see him and that was fantastic, man. And he was sitting up having a press conference and he told Rockmont, evidently, go out there and get Harold Bell and bring him up here. And I sat with the, <laughs> with the champ while he conducted a press conference. And I might have been one or two or three blacks in the whole, must have been about 50 or 60 uh, media people around. But he called me out and asked me to sit with him. And then he said, uh, afterwards, we went inside to, uh, to have lunch, some hot dogs and beans. Uh, his mother was cooking hot dogs and beans. And uh, we were sitting around the table. And he said, Harold, what you want to do? I said, man, I'm, I, need to, I need to do an interview with you for television, man. He said, okay, well, you know I'm getting ready to break camp. I'm going back to Chicago to get ready to go to Africa to meet George Foreman. He said, why don't you come on to Chicago and let's talk about it. And so uh, I got Rodney Brown, who's one of my producers on the, on the interview, to, we flew to Chicago. And uh, we were met at the airport by Pat Patterson, his security guard, really a great brother, man. He took us to the to the um, to where they was having training, and man, they were packed in it. Reporters were packed in them, and he was he was really one of the, of course, top sports figures in the world at the time. So we get in there, and he was he's working out about fifteen to twenty minutes. He just walk out the ring, man. So now I'm just left standing out there, me and Rodney, we talking, meeting some other people, and while we're standing out there, again, who comes up but Rockman? He said, Harold, the champ want to see you in the dressing room. I said, okay. I didn't even, I, I said, I wonder, what, does he really know that I'm here? And here comes Rock Bar. So I go back down there and, and champ is on the, on the table getting a massage, you know, he's getting a massage. So he got a chair in front of him to tell me to sit down. So he said, okay, okay. Now what you want to do, man? I said, champ, I told you what I want to do, man. I want to do a one-on-one -on -one interview for television. He said, oh, okay, that ain't no problem, man. We could do that in Zaire. I said, what? <laughs> Zaire? He said, yeah. You know I'm going to Zaire to fight that chump, George Foreman. I said, yeah, I know, man, but I ain't going no Zaire. He said, what? I said, man, I ain't going no Zaire. He said, what's wrong with you, man? I said, man, I'm scared to fly across the ocean. Oh, man, he hollered and screamed. <laughs> I thought he would get up off the table and start boxing. He said, wow, he called me chicken and everything else. I said, man, look, I don't care what you say. I am not flying across the ocean. So we leave there. We go have dinner. And as I'm getting ready to prepare, uh, Pat is going to take us back to the airport. He comes up beside me and whispers in my ear. He says, since you're scared to fly across the ocean, as soon as I knock this sucker out, you will be the first one out to interview me. Oh, man, you know I ain't paying no attention. They're always talking crazy, right? So, man, Pat Patterson took us back to the airport, Rodney and myself, and we got on the plane, came on back to D.C. But the thing, I didn't tell Rodney that Muhammad Ali had invited me to go to Zaire because Rodney would have went off. He know I had turned that down. So we go back, come on back to D.C., and sure enough, man, there's a fight close circuit down at Constitution Hall. Now, this friend of mine, Harry Barnett, who was in the boxing, it was putting on the on the close circuit. So down, this is on my wedding night, the 30th of November. So I called Roy Jefferson and his wife Candy. I said, man, come on, let's go to Constitution Hall, man. I got some tickets for the fight. So Roy said, okay. So we meet up down in the Constitution Hall, man. You know, that was it was chaos, man. It, people talking, plenty of smack, man. And uh, we went up in the balcony, man. And, uh, and man, sure enough, man, I'm scared to death, man. Muhammad Ali, man, 
Nobody knew his strategy going into the ring that he was going to do this robo dope. Not Angelo Dundee or anybody else. This was something that he decided on his own. And buddy, he wore George out. George, I mean, they he he took a beating. But George could not take it on any longer, man. And Muhammad Ali knocked him out in the eighth round. And I almost fell over the balcony. Roy Jefferson caught me. I was so excited. I almost fell over. And uh, hey, man, that was a beautiful night, a night that I will never forget, man. Not thinking five nights later, I'm going to be lying home in the bed, man. And it's raining like hell outside. And uh my wife put me over by the phone because John Thompson, P.D. Green, Don King, Jim Brown, they be calling me all hours of night, two and three o'clock in the morning. So I had to put me over by the phone. So I'm lying there, man, I'm sleeping good because it's raining, right? And man, the phone rings. I ignored it. I, I, I didn't even go answer it. Had to hit me with an elbow in the back. Say, get the phone. <laughs> so I picked up the phone. I, I said, who's calling, man? He said, I want to speak to Harold Bell. That's what the boy said. I want to, I said, man, who's calling? I want to speak to Harold Bell. And before I can say who's calling again, he said, fool, this is the heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. I said, wow, man, I sit up straight. I thought I was, I thought I was dreaming. I thought I was dreaming. So Hattie looked at me and she said, she whispered, say, who is it? And I said, Muhammad Ali. She turned over and went back to sleep. She didn't even believe me. She turned over and went back to sleep. <laughs> so I said, champ, champ, what's happening? He said, you still want to do that interview? I said, yeah, I want to do the interview, man. Congratulations, man. I'm so happy for him. And to hear his voice, man, was, was amazing. Because, man, if you stop and think about this, man, here this man has had the biggest fight of his life. You hear what I'm saying? He's coming back on a plane, private plane, with Rockman, his brother, his wife, and his girlfriend. And he lands in New York. And he gets to the hotel and he calls Harold Bell. Are you kidding me, man? Today, I am still amazed by Muhammad Ali calling me before Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes, Brian Gumbel of uh, Good Morning America, uh, NBC, and his main man, Howard Cosell, who everybody thought had, you know, Muhammad Ali's ear. But I was the chosen one. I was the chosen one, man. And there you today, are right there. There you are right there. Yep, yep. That's the interview. And that interview right there, you will see, he has a black eye. He never allows anyone yep. to interview him with marks on his face. He got a black eye, man. And uh, if you see this anywhere else, you know somebody that stole my interview. You understand? <laughs> somebody that stole my interview. But that was awesome, man, because the, what I think what, what was amazing, we sat down and we spent two, two minutes on sports talking about boxing. The rest was about the game called life, man. You hear what I'm saying? He talked about children. He talked about crime in our streets. He talked, he talked about the racism. You name it. He talked about it. That's, that's well, what makes this one of the amazing interviews with Muhammad Ali. Let's look at let's take a look at a couple other pictures. And I want to get your take. Just briefly, just tell us what does this picture say to you? Just tell us about your what you know about the man and the people in this photo. Well, man, all those guys are some legends, man, and uh, uh, they took a stand. They took a stand, something you don't find today. That's, that's Jim Brown. That was led by Jim Brown, bringing all those folks together to support Muhammad Ali and what uh, America was trying to do to him, take his title, all because he said he was going, not going into the uh, United States Army to fight somebody who's never did anything to him. And you can see them down there on Muhammad Ali's right. That's the great Bill Russell. Uh, on, then, of course, that's Jim Brown in the middle and the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And that's uh, uh, Bobby, Bobby Mitchell back there, too. And, um, oh, man, now this is uh, this, uh, <laughs> great, great, some great people, man. That's um, Stokes over there who was the on the left over there, all the way on the end. 
That's Mayor Stokes of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, Brown was real uh, close with. And uh, that's the Davis guy back there from the Green Bay Packers, already in the back, man. So yep. he, he had some powerful people supporting him, man, and uh, got a lot of support. And of course, you guys know they overturned uh, that whole thing uh, with the U.S. Army. And Muhammad Ali went on to uh, accomplish so much, man, in such a short time. Take a look at this one. You, you remember that? Oh, yeah. I remember that. I remember where I was. I was in Baltimore to watch it on closed circuit. And, uh, man, uh, I lost money on that one. <laughs> I lost money on that. That's a, that's a knockdown. That knockdown, really, that fight was close, man. In fact, I thought Muhammad Ali was winning because, I, you know, I was betting. But uh, that was the blow. Uh, I think, what was that knockdown? The 14th or 15th round was that? Uh, 14th round, I think, yeah. 15th round, yeah. He popped right back up, though. Yeah, he jumped right back up. He, uh, the smoking Joe hit him with, with that left hook, I think it was. And yeah, yeah, but he got back up, man. And uh, man, those two guys, man, I think they had to spend a couple of nights in the hospital after that fight, yep. man. Yep, it was brutal, man. Muhammad Ali said it, felt, it felt like death to him. Great, great, wow. great. Joe Frazier was a great man, man. Great man. How about this one? Okay, that's uh, I know exactly where we were. We were in Philadelphia, they were doing um, uh, the, the Frazier family and uh. Uh, Ali people had put together uh, something kind of bring them back together. This was after, you know, their careers was over because there was so much animosity uh, between the two. And some folks decided that they would put on a big tribute to both of them in Philadelphia. And Hattie and I and went up there with Bert Sugar and Jim Brown. And that's what, that was in Muhammad Ali's room when Hattie took that picture. But there was still animosity, man, even after that. I remember I, I remember I got up early uh, to to check and get a newspaper about the, the fight. And I, when I came back, Muhammad Ali was standing in the it was about five o'clock in the morning, standing in the, in, the, in the lobby with Hattie. And Hattie was telling me, I'm Harold Bell's, I'm Harold Bell's wife. Muhammad Ali, and as I walked in the door, she pointed and he started clapping. He started clapping. <laughs> he was he was a great he was a great brother, man. He he really was, man. And that other picture that you saw was with um, Mayor Washington. Now, after Muhammad Ali comes back from Zaire, there was a friend of mine by the name of Jimmy Denson. He was the uh, he was the man, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. And Jimmy called me and said, Harold, look, we're going to honor Muhammad Ali as the athlete of the century. He said, he's coming to the airport, and I need for you to go pick him up. I said, ain't no problem. So Jimmy lent, lent me his Cadillac, and I went out to the airport to pick Muhammad Ali up. And I ain't had no problem finding him, man. People were all over. He's, he's supposed to be over there picking up his bag. But Veronica, his girlfriend, is sitting there. I had never met Veronica, right? And uh, I went over to her and said, I'm Harold Bell. I'm supposed to pick you guys up. She said, well, when you get that fool, he's over there doing magic tricks and everything else. And he will not pick up our baggage so we could get out of here. So I stood up on, a, on something, man, and I hollered. I said, hey, champ, it's Harold Bell. Come on, we got to go. He said, Harold Bell, be cool. I'll be there when I get there. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, of course, man, we went to uh, the, Shor the Shoreham Hotel where he was having the event. And what happened, uh, I put Veronica in one uh, room and Muhammad Ali and I went to another room and we sat down, we talked for a while, man. And um, he had the, this briefcase with him that you saw him getting off the plane with, man. And in that briefcase was a million dollars. I knew what was in the briefcase when I saw it because when I did the interview with him in New York, he went to the briefcase and opened it up and gave me a hundred dollar bill. And I, man, I said, yeah, there's that briefcase that <laughs> gets off the plane. I said, man, what you doing with all that money? He said, you don't think I was gonna leave all the money back there for Don King to steal, do you? I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, that makes sense to me. But we were at the Sheraton Hotel getting ready for the tribute. Man, they must have had about 5,000 people there standing up around the walls, man, for this thing. And Mayor Washington was presenting him 
uh, with the uh, a plaque, the award for African century. So now while Mayor Washington is presenting him this, Muhammad Ali stopped him. He said, hold it, <coughs> hold it, Mr. Mayor, hold it, Mr. Mayor. Mayor said, yeah, yeah, champ. He said, do you know Harold Bell? The mayor, mayor looked at him all, all funny. He said, do you know Harold Bell? So now the mayor is, is looking out, looking for me out in the audience. He don't know what to do. So they're hiding, Veronica, my mother-in-law and mother, all of them looked at me like I'm crazy. I don't know what this man is doing. So he said, uh, Mr. Mayor, let me tell you. Mr. Mayor said, yeah, I know Harold Bell. Who don't know Harold Bell? So the champ said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Mayor. That's, that's my friend. And I don't want anything to happen to Harold Bell on your watch. If anything happens to Harold Bell, you go, you go pay the price. Do you understand, Mr. Mayor? The mayor said, yeah, champ. He said, you're not as dumb as you look. And boy, the people fell out. The crowd fell out, man. Hattie said she felt like crawling under the table. <laughs> but that was Muhammad Ali, spontaneous, man. You never knew exactly what he was going to do or what he was going to say. Oh, he loved kids, man. He loves himself some children, man. And that was, uh, if you were a pretty woman, you had no, you were no competition if some kids were around. He was going to take to them kids, man. I think that's why he and I had that, that common uh, goal of, of young people, man, of reaching back to, to help our young people. And he stayed on me about that too, man. He you see that little girl he's talking to? Uh-huh. She ended up being his wife. That's Lonnie. Is, oh, is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Wow. Is a little girl. I always wondered who that little girl was. Wow. She was in the neighborhood. And so she, I mean, years later, she ended up marrying him. Yeah. And taking care of him, you know, until he died. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, fantastic. That's your interview with him? That's yeah. the money? Yeah. What about this? Yeah. That was his main man, man. That was, he loved this man. He loved this man. But uh, the Nation of Islam turned him against uh, a Malcolm because Malcolm uh, kind of knew he didn't like what was going on with the nation, especially with the leader. And uh, so they kind of blackballed Malcolm and uh, Muhammad Ali kind of fell in line. He didn't want to, man, but he did. And he told, we, when we were in that room at the Sheraton Hotel, we talked about that. He said that is one thing that he really regrets, uh, Malcolm X. You know, he figured that he could have could have saved Malcolm. You know, but Malcolm was pretty much his own man too. You know, he did things his way, and uh, that was one of the one of the biggest regrets uh, that he had during his whole journey uh, through boxing and through, of course, the political. Uh, thing uh, with the nation of Islam. You know, um, there was a lot of talk that I've read over the years that toward the end, uh, Ali felt bad about the way he talked about Joe Frazier throughout their trilogy, uh, you know, in terms of promoting the fight that maybe he went too far. Mm -hmm. And I saw this photo where I guess there were many attempts to bring those two together, you know, toward the end. Yeah, but that was, that yeah, that was a very difficult relationship. I, I interviewed Joe uh, here in Washington at, uh, on WST radio. Uh, he came by the, by the station. And this was after this was after George Foreman had knocked him down about eight times. <laughs> That's the kind of man he was. He wasn't even paying no attention. So he came by and uh, I interviewed him and we had a ball, man. He said, man, it felt like a bouncing ball. Every time George hit him, he got up, he'd go back down. But uh, the relation between him and Muhammad Ali uh, was never mended, really, you know. And, and, and Joe was such a good human being, man. He was, he was a sweet guy, man, you know, very soft-spoken and uh, a good old country boy. That's exactly what, what he was, and that's how I saw him, man. Yeah. That was a how about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my man there. That's Rockman. Ali, Muhammad Ali's only sibling. And he was a man that had his brother's back in the early years, man. You know, he was he was the security blanket. And Rahman was responsible for my success with Muhammad Ali. 
because I know I, all I had to do was call Rockman and he'd get him on, get Muhammad Ali on the phone. I remember when we did, um, I had to take, after we shot the interview, I had to take it back so the champ could see it to see how he liked it. So we went back up to uh, the Poconos Mountains one weekend, one beautiful weekend, and I had called the Rockmont to see, to tell him the champ, you know, we're coming up here. I got the got the editing done, and I want him to see the interview. So Rockmont said, come on, man, it's a beautiful day. Come on up there. Man, when we got up there, Rockmont met us. He said, man, I got some bad news. I said, what's wrong, man? He said, man, Lola Falana is in camp. And she got <laughs> You got them hot pants on. I said, oh, my God. But for people who may not realize, back in the day, Lola Falana was, who maybe she was like what Beyonce is to some people today. I mean, she yeah. was she was what they call back in the day a siren. Yes, she, <laughs> she was. Yes, she yes. was hot. So anyway, man, I said, oh, my goodness. So he said, Harold, come on. Uh, let's come on. Take, I'm going to take you down to the, this, the, this log cabin. And you and Rodney wait in there and let me see what I can do. So, man, about an hour later, I, through the door goes Muhammad Ali and Rachma, and boy, Muhammad Ali was hot. He said, Harold, what you want? I said, champ. I said, champ. Rodney turned on the, he turned on the, <laughs> on the, the camera and the video and it started running and that got his attention. So he said, man, it was about, about 45 minutes later. He said, man, that is great, man. Yeah, you guys did a great job with that. He said, go ahead and do whatever you want with it. I love it. And uh, that's what that's how important Rockmont was to me, man. And it's sad to me that Rockmont was there, you know, through all the early times. And then when he started to become big, they, they kind of pushed him back, you know, the nation for one, kind of pushed him back secondary role. And then Don King was not any better, and that's a that was that was terrible. And right now, today, man, I am really upsets me to to know that Rockman, after Muhammad Ali got that fifty million dollars in cash, uh, those folks uh, who brought the rights to his name and likeness and gave him twenty percent of the advertising, that Rockman is living in a roach infested apartment in Louisville. He's in a, and he was on a walker. He's now, uh, you know, in a wheelchair. There's no, it's, it's no excuse, man, for this brother not to be getting a check every month from the Muhammad Ali estate. He is, he is Muhammad Ali's only sibling, man. Even, even the, the museum, man, they have not treated him right. And of course, with him being a wheelchair, you know, and I think. Uh, my buddies tell me he's coming down with a touch of dementia, but Rockman was such a sweet soul, man. I know he was like a brother to me, man. And uh, I just to know that in the condition that, and I understand Layla Ali, you know, Muhammad Ali's uh, daughter that he had with Veronica and the rest of the siblings, why are they not looking out for their only uncle, their only uncle of, of, of Muhammad Ali, the only brother of Muhammad Ali? that they allow him to live in Louisville in those conditions, man. He deserves better. And uh, I, sent, I sent you some pictures of, uh, of, uh, of Rockman and his mom and dad. And, and when they were- Yeah, not all of them were able to come through. That's why I sent, showed you the one with yeah. him and uh, his brother, Ali. Yeah, but Rockman, man, was one of a kind, man. He was just like, he was just, he was just like Muhammad Ali, but- and always, man, and when that, that fame and that cash come in there, man, a lot of people are forgotten, man. That's why I'm, I was so surprised that I got, you know, the call from Muhammad Ali after one of the biggest fights of his career, that he remembered, he promised me. And that's the thing about what we don't have today. He was a man of his word, man. If he gave you his word, you could carry it to the bank. You could carry it to the bank, man. And that's what it was all about. Money, money was no big thing to him. He carried that million dollars around just to give to other people. Now, who he gave it to, I don't know, but I know what he was doing. That's the kind of heart that he had, man. I remember he in the room, he opened up that, opened up that briefcase and said, you need anything, Earl? That was so much money, it scared me. I said, no, I'm okay, champ. I'm okay. <laughs> take, a, oh. take, take a look at this one. This is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Man, that was something else. Yeah, that, that was... 
that was heart wrenching, man, to see him walk uh, in Atlanta. That was uh, I think what was that the Olympic? Um, yep, carrying the Olympic torch. Carrying the Olympic torch. Yeah, that was uh, that that was something else. That showed you really uh, the heart of this brother. Uh, he was still in the fight, man. And uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a great picture, man. You know, one of the things I think you had, I was uh, listening to your last comment. It it sparks or begs the question for me. Um, what will you remember most? about Muhammad Ali and your relationship with him? Well, let me tell you something, man. It was 2007 and uh, Mike Tyson was fighting down at the uh, arena. What's that, what's that, the Wizards Arena downtown? And um, Layla Ali was fighting on the card. So Rock Newman, uh, Notorious Rock Newman uh, became a part of the promotion. I told the guys, I warned the man, look, hey man, watch, watch your back, watch your money. So in the meantime, I'm trying to get tickets for all my people, find some way to, to get them into the arena. And I just got kind of lost in the mix. And uh, I had a group of young men that Dr. Arnold McKnight, who was the boxing commissioner, had, had you know, okay to let them sing uh, the national uh, anthem at the fight. Well, Rock Newman jumped in and and and, uh, and knocked that out of the box. So now I had to explain that to uh, to the young men because now he wanted uh, uh, Levert, uh, the young Levert, to see it to sing. And I just happened to run into uh, uh, Levert outside the arena, and I went up to him and told him what was happening. He couldn't believe. He said, "What?" He said, "Don't worry about it. I deal with it." And he did not sing the national anthem that night. So I got all caught up in the mix. So now the fight is about over, man. I done missed everything. So I'm walking back through the arena, trying to get to where the champ is. And one, I don't, man, to this day, I don't know who this guy was, but boy, he was the one. He said, Harold Bell. I said, yeah. He said, man, the champ looking for you. I said, what? He said, yeah, man, he's down ringside. He's coming this way. He said, you see that? That black SUV over there, he said, that's what we're traveling in. Go over and stand by the SUV. So I went over there, man, and sure enough, here comes Muhammad Ali. He got thrones of people following behind him, you know, thrones of people. And he with Veronica. He's not with the, the other gal that who's his wife. I, told, I guess he told her to stay home. You know, this is Veronica's child, and we're going to uh, meet to be at the uh, ringside with Layla. So now he comes. He's coming toward me. And man, all these people are falling. And boy, when he saw me, man, he pushed everybody away, man. Came up, man, and hugged me, man. And uh, I had these pictures with me that we had taken. And I took them out for him to sign. But he was, just, he was so shaky, man. I said, champ, forget that. Don't even worry about that, man. Don't even. Uh, uh, Rock must said, no, Harold, he wants to sign him, man. He wants to sign everything. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up taking them back for him. But that is what I remember, man how that particular night when he saw me, you know, it was, it was just like, man, my brother, man. And he came up and, and he hugged me, man. And uh, that was the last time I, I spoke to him, man, it was 2007, man, at the, at the arena, man. Yeah. Hmm. You had mentioned, um, and this is really speaks to your long career, but you had mentioned something earlier in this interview about your relationship uh, with Richard Nixon, and there you go. Yeah, that was uh, that was something else too. That was man. Did, I just realized that I was doing um, a timeline for another show in Atlanta uh, on yesterday. They're doing a piece too on this Muhammad Ali 48th uh, anniversary, and I and I was telling uh, the host, uh, the the lady that was hosting the show, I said, "Do you realize that I just realized that as I was doing this timeline, that I am the only one on the planet." that can say, that can claim that I broke bread and became close friends with two of the most controversial uh, <laughs> human beings in American history. And I said, that's Muhammad Ali and Richard Nixon. She said, wow, you are right. I say, I am the only one that I know that can claim that they were my friends and I broke bread with a man and uh, they looked out for me. They had my back. Both of them may have had my back, man. You know, I think about people 
At the time, Gary, when I was invited to the White House, man, I didn't know about no politics, Republican or Democrat, man. All I knew was the, the president was inviting my wife and I to the White House. And I was not going to turn that down. They could talk all that, all that stuff they want, man. You crazy? I'm going to the White House. But that's how we think, man. That In our community, that's how we think. But when I looked at it, you know who beat me to the White House? Duke Ellington, <laughs> with Nixon I'm talking about, Duke Ellington, Sammy Davis, uh, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, all of them beat me to the White House. But that kind of jealousy comes through, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't deserve to go to the White House. But man, no, that, that was a great moment too, Gary. Uh, the president of the United States invites you to the White House, man, and he remembers those days that we had on the golf course at Burning Tree. and. Uh, when I stop and, and I think about that, he appointed me a guy by the name of Herb Klein. Herb Klein was the director of communications for the Nixon White House. One of the most beautiful human beings, one of the most honest. He was the most honest person in the administration. He was so honest that the president didn't trust him. <laughs> in fact, if you look up the history, uh, he kicked uh, Herb Klein to the curb, man, at the end because Herb was going to be honest about whatever thing. it went on and, and the president had to, had to get him out of there. But Herb, man, well, was, was my man. Anything I wanted, all I had to do was call Herb Klein because he had told Herb, you, you look out for Harold Bell. And that's what Herb Klein did, man, that whole four years, man, until they, they rolled out of here, man. Yeah. But you know- Well, with the, with the time, we, we only got a, a minute or two left, but uh, there you but, are with the greatest. Yeah, I want, Any final thoughts or words? Yeah, I, I want to say, man, that I'd like to give credit uh, to Jim Vance, man, uh, who was uh, my partner. And, of course, um, we all know what went down. Legendary news anchor in Washington, D.C. Yeah. The, Jim Vance was the one that got me into do my first television debut, that special with Muhammad Ali. Uh, Roy Jefferson and Billy Kimmel was a part of it. And we ran it in prime time at 3.30 uh, the Washington Redskins were playing the Oakland Raiders at four o'clock. So we're talking about prime time, man. I'm the first black to ever host and produce his own television special on NBC WRC TV four, man. And uh, that was uh, that 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 was a great moment too. That's when uh, uh, Jim Vance went to bat for us. I didn't get get paid for it, and they used they pipped me. They don't start doubt about it. They pipped me, but I own the rights to that interview. So don't let nobody tell you anything. I got the copyrights to it. I got the affidavits and everything, man. So here we are 48 years later. We get ready to come up on the 50th anniversary, which is going to be big in 2024. God willing that I'm still here. Uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to show the whole interview, man. You will love the interview. You will love the interview is this out of sight. Oh, I mean, really on the one. So I just want to say, hey, man, thank you for taking time out, man. And there were a lot of other people that I would love to have given uh, their praises. There were a lot of people I like to cuss out, but I'm going to keep on getting up. <laughs> well, that's for another show, uh, <laughs> cussing them out. But uh, for folks who want to keep up and learn more about Harold Bell, we're going to put uh, a, a placard there on the screen that they can follow you. It's your blog. Let's do a shameless plug with your blog and also on blackmenandamerica.com. Tell us about your blog. Well, my blog is uh, Speak the Truth. And it's a blog that uh, I got with you. Uh, and we decided to do an hour on Sundays uh, from three to four. And uh, man, that has really uh, turned into a great, great piece because this is Speak the Truth, man. And what, what I like about it, man, ain't no yes men on there, you know? Everybody, everybody can hold their own. They ain't on there, yes, and Harold Bell or anything else, man. We be telling the truth, the information that our people uh, need to enhance our community, man. Because when things are going down, man, it does not look good for Black folks in 2023. Believe me, if we don't get together, it was a show uh, on the other night, Gary. You watch uh, the Grio. Yes, the Grio Award, first annual Grio Awards, Grio. sponsored by Byron Allen in the Grio. Had some had some great people on there. It was a great, I mean, some talented people. But eighty percent of the people on there are part of what's wrong in Black America. 
And uh, if we had one piece, Garrett, I'm going to try and you get the find on Peoples, man. Peoples, yeah. We'll see if we can get that. Yeah, well, that and was. play that, the, the, the developer. Yeah, he developed, um, man, a, he, he had a great presentation. That was the, that was the best part of the show to me. He's a, okay, a, yeah. All right, so final word on Muhammad Ali. What do you say? What, what, what should people know or remember about Muhammad Ali before we close out? That uh, Muhammad Ali, man, is one of the reasons he and Richard Nixon why I close the show the way I do every week. That every black face you see is not your brother, every white face is not your enemy. Muhammad Ali was not racist in any kind of way, man. You know what I'm saying? He loved everybody, but he, he kept it real. He knew what was going on around him, man. That's why I loved him so. He kept it real, man. Angelo Dundee, man, by nobody bet not mess with Angelo Dundee. In fact, one guy did uh, take a, a, a stole Angelo Dundee when he was with Sugar Ray Leonard. And Angelo Dundee, that brother was getting ready to be taken out of here, not by Muhammad Ali, but by some other people. Angelo Dundee told everybody, hold up, you know. But Muhammad Ali loved him some Angelo Dundee. He loved all people, and especially okay. he loved children. Children, yes. That's the key, man. Thank you. All right. Mr. Harold Bell, thank you very much. And uh, this has been great. I know a lot of people learned a lot here about Ali and about you. So they'll be following you on Speak the Truth. And we'll uh, we look forward to hearing more about Ali and his 50 years and your work. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Great, great, great holiday, man. It's a great holiday. Thank mm -hmm. you.